Good morning. I'd like to welcome our Facebook worshipers to join us here at New Hope Baptist Church in our worship service this Sunday morning. Again, it's an exciting Sunday morning. Uh, we're having four baptisms this morning. Uh, so I'm doing the announcements instead of, again, our pretty face pastor, so I'll bear with me here. Uh, we're so glad to see so many visitors here. It's really exciting. We've got a little visitor's cards. So I think you'll see them up, up front. If you would, or in the back. In the back. Oh, and so if, if, if you would fill those out and place them uh, in the pew there in front. So uh, with that, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, have our baptisms. Uh, Father God, again, it's so good to be in your house. Uh, we just thank you for this glorious morning. Uh, this fall weather is, is such a reminder, Lord, that a time to relax and, and just uh, in, enjoy your presence. Uh, Father, we pray for our country. There's so many uh, important things happening right now with the election. Uh, we, we pray that that goes well, Lord. Uh, we want to just pray for the safety in this COVID issues, Lord. Those that are sick, be with them, uh, heal them, uh, protect all of us from, from this COVID. Uh, Lord, we just uh, pray for uh, our realization of how much you love us, Lord, and, and help us to trust you more to give us more peace and joy in our lives. Uh, again, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 This is Izzy. <laughs> Sounds like someone that should be in a rock group, doesn't it? <laughs> God has moved greatly this week. We're really excited about what God is doing. And uh, Izzy and I had a long talk back here just talking about Jesus and everything and you know, we were talking, she talked about Jesus being omnipresent and omniscient. And she said, that's what I need. That's what we all need. So is, your, is it your testimony that you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Yes. All right. And I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised with him to walk in the innocent of life. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. son and after mama got saved he, and uh, sister was talking to him this is Zane and Zane says I said what do you think about baptism what do you think it means and he says well and about salvation itself he says it's an opportunity for a new start and it is an opportunity for a new start is it your testimony that you trusted Jesus as Savior yes, all right and I baptize you my brother in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit buried with him in the likeness of his death Raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection, and thus to walk in the newness of life. And by the way, he was the easiest. The rest of them had fought to walk. <laughs> Almost all of them sat in the same chair. Uh, there's one chair that's full of tears from three different ladies, but he was in a different chair. All right. All right. Tell them your name. This is Rachel. <laughs> Rachel trusted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior, and we talked for a long time. And uh, it's just awesome to see the things that God is doing, and, and Rachel was part of uh, Jaron's decision as well, helped him to, to make that decision, and just God is doing so many good things. It is, your, is it your testimony that you trusted Jesus as Savior? All right. I baptize you, my sister. You grab that. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> You baptize people. You baptize people with certain kind of nose rings. You let them hold it themselves. <laughs> Baptizing people in the 2000s, in the 2020s. Come on down. All right. Last but in no way least, Big Jaron here. Yeah. Big Jaron has trusted yeah. Jesus Christ as a Savior. Is it your testimony that you've trusted Jesus? Anything you want to add to that? All right, no? I'm baptizing my brother in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him. In the light of some This guy's already doing 
ministry stuff. He's getting trained to be media. Just he didn't join yet. That's what we need. All right. Tom's like, wow, I won't have to do everything around here. Hey, uh, I need a volunteer at the back. If you're a visitor, raise your hand. Somebody go back there and grab a bunch of those bags and pass them out to our visitors. Uh, Les York, thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Bev, if you want to help us, we got a bunch of bags under the pew back there. If you're a visitor, if you'll raise your hand, we'll get you a bag. If you're a visitor also, please fill out the little card. There's a giving box at the back, so we don't have to pass around an uh, offering plate. If you'll just put that card back there, we'll know who you are, and we can touch base with you. And thank you very much. Just, that's right. Uh, Joanne reminded me that we're trying to get things together for our Christmas play. So if you would volunteer for the Christmas play, just some small part, be willing to do that. Just get with Joanne and uh, she'll, she's putting all that together. Hey, let's pray, shall we? Let's thank God for what he's done. Father God, we thank you for salvation. We thank you for the incredible things you've done this morning. We thank you for the picture of what you've done for us and what you did what you did in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. That's all. Um, the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so when we trust Jesus, we are covered with his blood. And that's, that's just a beautiful thing.
stand again. Join us on this song. This song is not in the hymnals out there. It's an old uh, one I hope most of y'all know, but we're going to have to watch the words on the screen. How great thou art. So the song that we're going to do is called Oh Lord, You're Beautiful by Keith Green. And Keith Green was, um, he was a hippie in the 70s. And um, if you've been a Christian for a long time like I have in the 80s, you will know Keith Green. He was one of the first contemporary uh, Christian artists. And uh, he set out on his own when he was 15. And he always had uh, just a real hunger to know the truth. And he, through the hippie, hippie movement, what they all did, you know, free love and drugs, all that, he, he went through all that and he was searching for God. And um, he found the Lord and he became such um, a wonderful Christian artist. And um, he was only a Christian for about three years and then he died. But he just left such a huge mark on, um, I guess on, Christianity today and so many of our songs are 
inspired by him. And um, this was one of the songs that he wrote, and it's just incredible. And we're not going to sing all the verses uh, for the sake of time, but one of the verses that I'm leaving out, I just wanted to read you guys. It says, Oh Lord, my body's tired, but you keep reminding me of many holy, tireless men who spilled their blood for thee. So we're going to sing this song together. It's called, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful. And when your part, when it says all, that means you're all going to sing with me, with us, and you're going to all stand, okay? Okay, you can stand now. <laughs> so this is the worship leader part. Oh. 
Facebookers get to just join us as we do some family business. If you're a deacon, please make your way over to the organ side. And the kiddos are excused to go with what? You can fix my hair. Go ahead. She said, every time you baptize people, you come out and your hair is fuzzy. Let's fix it. Men need help. All right. All right, well, it's Deacon Appreciation Day. The Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due. And we have some people that we want to thank. And we're going to extend that a little bit beyond our deacons, too, this morning. But... Uh, first of all, we have uh, six active deacons right now. Here go the little ones. Look out, Grace. Grab something. First of all, we will recognize Larry. Come up here, Larry. Now, if you play pickleball with him, his nickname is Scary Larry. But Larry's our, he's the one that, keep, he's the one that keeps us safe. He's our uh, risk management uh, executive and always looking out for us. And he also heads up our benevolence team and he does a lot, and he's teaching our Sunday school class over here, so we're really thankful for you. So since you're a deacon and you have to work all the time, we give you this pocket tool here. You know, it's a knife, it's a screwdriver, it's a, you know, it's a, it's got nuts and bolts you can undo, so if something gets screwed up, you can unscrew, you know, you can fix it, so there you go. So y'all give Larry a hand and thank him. Larry works all the time. He comes up here and does secret stuff. He'll, he'll sneak up here with a tractor or sneak up here and poison plants and Weeds and whatever. Come up here, Ray. Y'all, y'all know the the Snoopy cartoon, and it has him as Joe Cool. This is Joe Cool for <laughs> New Hope. He keeps all of us, all of our air conditionings running. So you might need this next time you come to my house. You may need that. I don't know how many times he's been to my house, but you know he has to pray before he answers. If he sees me on speed dial, he's been to my house a bunch. And thank Ray. Give Ray a hand. All right, Tom. Tom is the Energizer Bunny. He's like, one of these days I'm going to get a new knee. And as soon as he got one, he's running up and down the aisles. This guy never, he never stops. And all the technology and stuff you see around here, he is cutting edge. He's constantly keeping us moving forward. You know, we really ought to do this. We really ought to do that. Okay, all right, okay. He keeps it going. So this guy keeps us up to date. If you've just been here and hadn't paid attention, all these, all these TVs that you see here, they're all new. Last year they weighed 100 pounds each. Now they're all featherweight, and he's got us all updated and new cables and Kimbro, who's not here today, he's spent nine hours up in the attic helping us run cables. So y'all give Tom a hand. Y'all know he does everything. All right, Benny, come on up here. Y'all know what Benny does. He does music. He does everything. He does cows. He, he knows everybody around here. If you need anybody to do anything, having to do with anything, he knows them. So Benny's your guy. He's your go-to guy. He knows everybody out here. And he's our kind of our patriarch, right? You led music here when you were how old? Oh, pretty young. Pretty young. <laughs> he's, he's been in this church a long time. So he's a, long a, time. he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, there's there's pillars and caterpillars. He's a he's one of the pillars. All right, come on, bud. <laughs> bud Bud's our other pillar. He's a, he's Bud is the voice of reason. He's look at him. He's cool, calm, and collected. <laughs> You will never see the pulse in his neck. You'll never see it. <laughs> this guy is so cool. He's like he's like Nestle iced tea, and he's a constant encourager. And uh, he keeps he keeps Cheryl relaxed. You know he takes care of her. So we appreciate you, and uh, learned a lot from you, and benefit from your friendship. And y'all give him a hand. <laughs> all right, who have I not? Is that is all the deacons we have? Or we miss? Oh, there's one that's not here. Okay. All right, we got a. We got we got a baptistry uh, the baptistry elf come here Steve Steve is uh, Steve Steve does a lot for us I, I'm gonna, I like you so much I'm gonna give you mine he keeps the he keeps the baptistry going and um, 
He keeps it at a reasonable temperature, right? Except for Gil. Except that one, uh, <laughs> Gil and I got in the water. I don't know, were we on Facebook yet? I think I got in the water. I'm like, Steve, because the thing, we didn't know the heat pump had gone out. And so uh, Neil had two religious experiences, the one where he trusted Christ and the one where he got in the water. And not for the reason that a lot of people have when they get in the water. He was just, you know, it was different. But I, I'm going to give you mine. I like you so much. I appreciate your help. Y'all give Steve a hand. All right. All right. little surprise here. Uh, Lynette and Cheryl, y'all come here for a second real quick. I know it means you got to walk in there. Yeah, it's okay. So these are the uh, my assistants. And uh, we need to give them a raise this year, really. Um, you know, the first year, the second year, I don't even know. These people work all the time. They work all the time. And, you know, they never know when they're going to need be needed. They never know when I'm going to call them. And uh, y'all call me when I get emergencies, and I call them when they get emergencies. So y'all remember Dallas SWAT, you know, when they said when people need help, they dial 911. When cops need help, they call SWAT, right? Well, here's SWAT right here. So uh, this is One Perfect Life by John MacArthur. And what this is, is this is a compilation of all the Gospels put in chronological order by John MacArthur. So there's a lot, of, you see how thick it is. There's a lot, well, there's a few of what you would call synthesis of the Gospels and or harmonized Gospels. Not very many, and usually only theologians get them, but he did a really good work on this, and you're going to enjoy that. So y'all give them a hand for all the work they do. All right. We'll just thank everybody else, too. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, camera ninja. Thank you, drummer, evangelist. Sound. Yeah. Brad. Brad and Neil are in the back. We'll give them a hand. Praise God for what they're doing. I'm going to give these to y'all, and y'all can pass these out to the appropriate people. And Rachel, I really do know your name. But you have to understand that after baptizing somebody named Izzy and Zane and, you know, that other Jerry, you know, it just, Rachel just sounds so normal after that. It's, just, it's confusing. It's just confusing. So, so, you know, apparently everybody's got a key to my office. I don't know where I'm going to kiss my wife. I just have to do that somewhere else, but... You know, I can't have any privacy in the office. Everyone's got a key. But somebody came in here and left this on my desk and put a question mark on it. And it says, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy guns, which is pretty much the same thing. So I appreciate that. Whoever, uh, it's an early pastor appreciation gift. And I do accept bullets, okay? 9 millimeter, 45 caliber, whatever you 22 if you can't afford that or if you can't find that. All right, let's go to John chapter 8. And we are in an amazing time. And I don't know when we've ever been in a time like this. I mean, there's always been politics and there's always been, you know, elections and stuff like that. It just feels like right now everything's so raw and everything's so hostile and everything's just like we've lost our civility. And I, I just, I've never seen anything like it. And those of you that don't know me, I, was, I worked for the Dallas Police Department for 28 and a half years and I've been on the front lines. I've, I've been downtown and we had 200,000 people down there. I was in Deep Ellum when we took batons and emptied Deep Ellum when we used to do our job. And nobody got hurt. We just we said it's time to go and it's time to go. We did it. Simple business. Anybody that argued got put in the paddy wagon and we were done. This is how it went. <laughs> it wasn't hard. It wasn't rocket science. And uh, so I, I'm just uh, amazed at the times that we live in. And so we're going to see Jesus as he tells the truth and as uh, satanic... Um, people that are that are not saved, that have chosen not to be saved, attack them and directly contradict them. We're going to see uh, some things that anybody that's ever trusted Christ has experienced this, and we're, going to, we're just going to see it played out. So let's pray this morning. Father God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you make it abundantly clear to us, and, and that we would respond, Lord, in obedience and joy, and by being instructed, and let us leave here never the same, uh, having taken what you showed us and, and living it. In Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Now, when I led uh, our folks to the Lord in the office, I told every one of them the same thing. You're going to be challenged, right? You're going to have trials, right? Did you? Yes, I know, because I got the other phone call. <laughs> it happens. When you trust Jesus Christ as Savior, when the truth is presented, when you accept the truth, when you embrace the truth, God's, the life and the light will always be the challenge. Will always be challenged, always. And you don't need a light if there's not darkness. But darkness will always try to swallow up the light, and the light will always pierce the darkness. And once you have the light, you've got it. Okay? 
And Jesus says, don't put your light under a bushel. Put it up here where it can add light to everything in the house. And that's what we need. We need the light of Christ. We need to reflect the light of Christ. We need to reflect it well. And so let's read Jesus. And Jesus, we're coming back to John 8. For those of you that don't remember, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's a time when the people of Israel are celebrating the fact that God brought them out of Egypt. And they're remembering the time that God was with them when they were on the journey in the wilderness. And they lived in booths, and then they lived in tents. They lived in temporary dwellings. But God appeared as a pillar of cloud by day and as a pillar of fire by night. And during this festival, they celebrated God's leadership and God's direction, even though they were in a wilderness place. And you're going to be in a wilderness place at some times in your life. A wilderness place is an in-between place. You were somewhere else, but you're going someplace that you're supposed to be. And for the people of Israel, they've been slaves. Their liberty had been taken from them. They were captives. They were treated poorly, treated roughly, whipped, beaten, uh, treated bad. And, and finally, God gives them independence. God gives them freedom. But on the way to the place that God has for them, they're walking through this wilderness. And the wilderness is never a comfortable place. It's a hot place. It's an uncertain place. You're nomadic. You'd prefer to build a house. Larry's been working on his house. He's been adding a room to his house. You'd prefer a permanent structure. But they had to have temporary housing. They would prefer to have built a temple, but they had to build a tabernacle because they were moving. They were nomadic. They were not able yet to put down roots until they found the place that God had for them, and they accepted it by faith. Because the initial group that got out of and, and, and left bondage failed a faith test, they had to roam for 40 years. God gave them a faith test. He said, I want you guys to go over here, and I want you to take it. Well, they sent out spies. They sent out recon. They sent out... Guys to go out and do reconnaissance and come back and give a report. Can we do this? Well, God told them to do this. So let me give you a little hint. If God tells you, don't ask. Don't, don't put it up for a vote if God says go. If God says go, do it. They voted. And it was a failure because 80% uh, voted against God. And so of between 1.5 and 3 million, we don't know the exact number, laid down and died in the desert over a course of 40 years because they put God on pause. And the next generation that said yes got to put down roots but even while there was a 40 year funeral ministry God was still God and his people were still his people and he was still there and he still ruled and he still reigned and he provided the law and he loved them and he led them and whatever wilderness you may be in right now that you may have no control of you may be in a wilderness because of your own choices you may be in a wilderness because of somebody else's choices there's many things that we're encountering right now that we didn't have anything to do with there's nothing we could do for some of the things that we're facing right now that are very challenging. But whatever it is, if you're in a wilderness place, God is still there. He still loves you. You're still his, and he still has a plan. So we still worship him. He still leads us. We still love him. He still feeds us, even though sometimes we're not always exactly where we want to be. And so they're in this place. And during this time, two things happen. They, they have water that they would pour over the altar. And that water poured over the altar was in remembrance of water that God gave them in the desert out of a rock. That God provided them not only direction, but refreshment out of the rock. And so that ritual reminded them. But there was another ritual that happened. And the other ritual that happened is called the lighting of the temple. And the lighting of the temple was where they brought in all of these menorah. They brought in all of these lights, lamps. Joanne loves lights. She had her little disco lights up here. She loves light. She loves to make it beautiful. She loves to make it dynamic. And, and that is going on here. And you already had these giant menorah, like two, three-story tall, big lanterns that they would light to light at the temple at night. But in addition, they brought in a bunch of other lights, and they just lit the place up like Christmas, like a Christmas presentation, like Christmas lights. And so the lighting of these lamps was to commemorate and help them remember that at night when they needed to be led from wherever it was they were to wherever it was God wanted them to go next. And God moved them around. He did. He led them. He led them by a pillar of fire by night in this lighting of the temple, which was very dynamic. What was the temple made of? Gold, white stone. You put the lights in there and you light that whole place up. It's reflecting off this white stone, off this gold. It's like Friday night lights. It's like a football field on a Friday night. It was like that, but even more beautiful, even more ornate. 
reflecting the majesty of God. And so at the end of the Feast of Booths, as they begin to light these lamps, as the darkness, which has swallowed up the temple, begins to be beaten back by everything that's inside of this area, all this light just pushes away the darkness. Jesus stands up. And in verse, chapter, verse 12 of chapter 8, he says, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And that's both a promise, a statement of fact, and an expectation, right? If you walk with Jesus, first of all, Jesus is light. And if you've ever been in the dark, and we all have, if you've ever been in uncertainty, and we all have, if you want to know where certainty is, find Jesus. If you're trying to figure something out and you can't figure it out, pick up your Bible, read, pray, go to Jesus. If you're having an argument and you just keep saying the same thing over and over and over again and you never break out of the script, stop, because it's not going to change. One person's going to say their thing, the other person's going to say their thing, they both have reasons for it, pause. Sometimes everybody can't be right. Go to the book, go to your knees, and ask God to move in. Hit the pause button, start over, let God rule, let God be your light. And I've seen it, and you've seen it, if you've been a Christian for 10 minutes, that when you pray and you ask God to reveal or to solve a problem, there are many, many times that before you stop praying, you already have the answer in your mind. Because God answers those prayers. He is a God of revelation. And when I preach from this pulpit, if you're wondering about Jesus, if you're not sure yet, ask him to reveal the truth to you, and he will. And people sitting out there are now sitting up here because... He did, and they did. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness. If you follow him, follow him. If you're his, walk like it, act like it, talk like it. Are there people that are his that quit acting like it? Yes, they do. The Bible warns against quenching the Holy Spirit. The Bible warns against grieving the Holy Spirit. We need to stay the course. You can't expel the Holy Spirit. If you've trusted Him, He's yours, you're His, you're sealed. It doesn't go away. But you can make the ride very miserable. Don't do that. Honor Him. Follow Him. The expectation that you follow Him. And when you follow Him, He will lead you somewhere. That's good news. You ever see a Christian that was someplace that no Christian ought to be? It does happen. If you are walking with Him, you will be in the light. And there are some places you just won't be. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness. I got a call from somebody I'd known growing up, and he was someplace he didn't need to be. And he was in an emergency because he was someplace he did not need to be. And my first thought is, why are you there? I know why I'm here. I get paid to be here. I got a gun and a badge. Why are you there? You don't belong there. You're out of place. You have a problem because you're out of place. If we keep our place and we follow him, we will be in the light. We need to be in the light. Do the right thing. We're all called upon to do that. But we'll have the light of life. Jesus is the light of life. The wages of sin is death. Jesus is the light of life. It's literally a contrast. Sin leads to death. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But don't miss that sin always leads to death. It's true spiritually. It's also true physically. And, and that is a physical reality. Charles Stanley, who now has, uh, is now emeritus as his church, he's uh, Timothy George, I think it is, is, is come on as senior pastor now. But uh, Charles Stanley talks all the time about the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. In like kind that you sow. You reap later than you sow. And you reap more than you sow. That law is always true. That's a physical law, and it's always true. God has not rescinded that law. Now, God is a God of grace, and sometimes God lets us start over. Sometimes God will come in and restore what the locust has eaten. It happens. But it's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. Sometimes uh, we have to deal with the physical ramifications of things that have happened. But look at what happens here that's very interesting. So Jesus stands up, and he says, I am the solution. I am the light, the light of the world. Come to me. 
He who follows me, that word follow, by the way, that word follow is a word that uh, a soldier follows his leader. That's a pretty, pretty absolute thing, right? Like if you're in the military and you're given a direct order and you don't do that, what happens? The brig, <laughs> you know, bad things, bad things happen. So this word follow, it's like follow Jesus like one follows a commanding officer. Uh, it's like one follows a teacher that they love and respect and they're going to follow very carefully the teaching. It's like one that doesn't want to break the law because there's rules. If they want to follow those rules, they want to stay in a club and they want to obey the law. And so they're very careful to obey that law. They research it because they don't want to miss anything. They want to do it right. That's the word follow. There. And by the way, let me just step back on something I said just a second ago. <clears throat> God is gracious, isn't he? God does heal, doesn't he? And God, God, listen, there are so many things in our life that God can give us grace for. And I've seen it over and over again. So whatever it is that's on our heart, whatever it is that we have done, whatever it is that we have regrets for, and every one of us have it. It is amazing the grace that God can give you. He loves you. And that love is magnificent. And that love is broad and wide and powerful. So anybody that hears my voice can think of something that you wish you could go back and delete. You can't. I can't either. But I can ask for God's grace. I can ask for his forgiveness. I can ask for restoration. I can ask that God manifest his glory and his power in my life and that I would be able to glorify him through that. That's where his children. He wants us to ask. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. So remember that. God loves you. His love for you is infinite. Watch what the Pharisees do. And when I watched debates this week and I saw them going back and forth and the way that people were talking to each other, specifically in one case, the attack, watch the flat contradiction, verse 13. And I may just read through here. Let me just go ahead and read through here, beginning in 12. Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will walk in the light. So the Pharisees said to him, you're testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Now remember, these Pharisees had already made plans to kill Jesus. They've already put a one out for his arrest. They've already been unsuccessful in arresting him. And Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. But if you do not know where I'm from or where I'm going, you judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true, and I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. By the way, when did that happen? Remember the baptism? Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove, the voice of God, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You remember the other time that it happened? They're on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter's like, this is great. We need to build three temples right here. And the voice says, this is my son. Listen to him. And then everyone disappears but Jesus and uh, Peter, James, and John. And it's apparent that, that Peter has kind of let put foot in the mouth again, right? But twice, twice in the Bible, God gives a physical manifestation, his voice declaring Jesus as his son, twice, twice, once in front of many, a second time in front of Peter, James, and John in the presence of Jesus. So they were saying to him, where is your father? And Jesus answered and said, you know, neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Verse 20, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. This is, none, this is nothing less than miraculous. He has presented himself as God. When he says, I am, he says, I am the light of the world. When he says, I am, that's called the tetragrammaton, he is claiming deity. It is the word in Hebrew that would be Yahweh. It is the word that means I am. It is the word that God gave for his name when Moses inquired, who will I say sent me? When he says, I am, he identifies himself as God, which is one of the two reasons they crucified him. Number one. Number two, when he says, I am the light of the world, he's not merely saying, I'm the light in the darkness. He is. He's not merely saying that uh, I'm going to show you where to go. He does. 
the light was very specific. And we talked about this a few weeks ago when we just preached the one verse. A few weeks ago, we just took this one verse and we just laid it out. And it looks like I don't have those notes. Yes, I do. Very good. Uh, when Jesus calls himself a light, every theologian in the temple that heard his voice knew what he was saying. Because throughout the Old Testament, the Messiah is identified as light. He's identified in Isaiah 42, 6. He's identified in 49, 6. He's identified as the light. Isaiah 61, Malachi 4, 2. He's identified as light. The one that's going to come is going to bring light with him. He's going to bring light with him. You will see the truth. You will understand what is going on. The one, the Messiah, the one coming was, was one of light. And so when Jesus stands up and says, I am, he identifies himself as God. When he says, I am the light, he identifies himself as the Messiah. So why such a quick, quick reaction on the part of these Pharisees? Because they've already put the warrant out for his arrest. They already planned to kill him. They're already angry with him. They already see him as a violation of their culture. They don't obey his rules. The ritual, the ritual worshipers, worshipers and the rule worshipers. They're not worshiping the true God. They're treating church like it's a culture. They're treating church like it's a club. Not like it's a place where you meet God. And people think of church, they think of religion. When you think of religion, you think of rituals and rules. But when you come to life, when Jesus becomes a savior, when he becomes your best friend, when God becomes your father, then it's about the heart. It's not about the letter anymore. It's about the heart. The letter follows because you want to honor God. You take his precepts. You want to honor him and his principles. But you're not out there just trying to check boxes to be a good club member. You are communing with the heart of God. You're talking to the heart of God. Last night, I walked outside and praying, preparing to preach and thinking about all my problems of the week and all the challenges that I have and trying to help you guys and do you any good whatsoever. And I look up at the stars and realize how little I am. Sometime, and you can do it out here because we don't have light pollution like in Dallas, look up at the stars. And get a perspective on how small we are. Jesus, I need your help. I can't do this job. You have to help me do this job. This is more than I can do. I'm not worthy. I'm not able to properly communicate, to most effectively communicate this word that is God-breathed that I was explaining to, to Zane when we were back here sharing the gospel. That this word, which is... God inspired, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, the word inspired means God breathed, theonoustos. And in your breath is moisture. And in the moisture in your breath are blood particulates. And in the blood particulates that are in your moisture, in your breath, is your DNA. This is the DNA of God. And when I'm trying to explain something, and Izzy and I are talking, and I'm trying to get an idea to her, and she's like, well, I'm, I'm trying to get it. And I go, okay, time out. And I read four passages. And I read four passages that answer her question. She goes, well, I can see that. Because I had to shut up and let this speak. I'm not Mr. Wizard. But I have the Word of God. And if you're trying to help somebody understand something, the best thing you can do is learn the Word of God. Because the Word of God... Jason's like, I thought he was Mr. Wizard. No, I'm not. Really not. Uh, <laughs> marital cross talk going on here. I thought he was Mr. Wizard. I'm not. Um, I'd like to be, but no. Listen, I mean, this is. I remember when I first became a police chaplain, and I, there had been a death, and I just went to the house. And I read the scripture. I prayed. And I left. And later, I had someone go, "That was amazing." All I did was read and pray. I didn't do anything amazing, but the Bible, the scripture, was amazing. God's word is alive. So when you hit that wall and you don't know what to do anymore, stop, pray, read. I'll tell you a more dynamic story. Should I tell? I, I was in the hood. You thought I was talking to you? I was in the hood. <laughs> squirrel. All right. Inside joke. I was in the hood. And I was a Baptist pastor uh, policing, and I had a Baptist deacon for a partner. And he said, we're going to go to this girl's house. She's demon-possessed. 
and we're going to pray for him. And I'm in uniform, and I'm like, okay, never done that at, job, at work before, but I'm willing. Uh, have you read that story in the Bible about the ones that tried to do that, and they got beat up, and they ran down the street naked? Because it's going to be hard to explain to the chief that we don't have our uniforms. It just doesn't go right. And so I was concerned. But, you know, we went. I'm, I'm fairly bold, even if I shouldn't be. So I went. And this girl's frothing at the mouth. She's making crazy noises. She's doing the exorcism thing. It didn't spin all the way around, but it almost did. And she was really, she was really lathered up. She was really just like in a, in a, in a, in a state. And so we all held, held hands, and I started saying what I knew to say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the demonic element come out, and I'm saying all this stuff, and nothing's happening. I'm like, this isn't looking good. And then I remember the Bible verse that says, these only come out by prayer and fasting. I didn't have a lot of time to fast, but I did pray. And when I prayed, and I stepped back in, I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she stopped acting like an animal. And she laid down and fell asleep. And they said that's the first time that she's slept in over 24 hours. I'm not hyper mystical. I'm not charismatic. God's power is real. God is real. And there's power in the name of Jesus. And there's power in his word. And if we're faithful to live it and to share it, amazing things will happen. Now, don't look at me sideways. It only happened once. I've only done that. I don't, I don't have a ministry of going out and doing exorcism. It happened one time. But it was an amazing thing. And the thing that made it amazing is that I did what I knew to do. Okay? What do you do? It's not like you write a book on exorcism. I, do what I, I did what I knew to do. And then the, the, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, reminded me of his scripture that I needed to apply. Dear Jesus, I can't do this. <laughs> we ask that you come in and handle this situation. And he did. And that's what we need. We need the peace of God. We need the truth of God. And what you see in the Pharisees is the most arrogant possible response to the Lord Jesus Christ. They gave flat contradiction. Flat contradiction is the most arrogant thing that you can do to anybody. Somebody says the sky's blue. No, it's not. It's green. It's arrogance. Maybe the sky you're looking at is green because something's happening in the sky you're looking at what you might say, rather than saying it's green, flat contradiction, because that's disrespectful, is you might say, well, I think the sky that you're looking at may be blue, but have you looked over here? Because there's a green banner over here. Maybe you haven't seen this. See, that's respect. And even when, and I shared up my devotion this week, Proverbs 15 is so amazing, so beautiful. You turn to it. It's worth it. It's worth it to do it. How do we persuade people? You know, Paul was very persuasive. And Paul was also very eloquent. So what made him effective? Paul was very effective. Remember when Paul went and there was a, a, there was a statue to the unknown God? Remember? What did Paul say? Paul didn't say, you're idolaters. We ought to stone you, you bunch of goofball, heretic, idiot. I mean, he didn't do that, right? Paul says... So the statue you have to the unknown God, can I tell you who that God is? Amen. That's persuasiveness, right? And all persuasiveness is, is giving respect to the person that you're talking to. That's all it is. But these people can't respect Jesus because they, they just want to murder him. They're murderers and they're liars. And Jesus is going to say later that, you know, the devil is the father of lies. Listen, we have a real enemy. We really do have an enemy and we have to understand that there is real evil out there. That's, that's something we have to understand. The devil's real. There is real evil. And all these sociologists that when people go out and kill 25 people, they're like, we just need to understand them. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe in order to catch them. But I, there's some things we don't need to understand. Okay? We don't need to understand everything. Evil is evil. And you can... You know, say that little brother stole his chocolate chip cookies and so, he, you know, he went crazy. You can find reasons and whatever. And, and there actually may be contributing factors, but we're all responsible for ourselves. And so we can act civilized. We can act like we love God. We can have love of God shine through us. We can reflect the light of Christ. And we can act like animals. We have a choice. And many theologians have said that we're all one generation from becoming savages. We are. We're either going to apply this book or we're going to act like whatever we want to act like, do whatever we want to do, and the consequence is chaos. 
Proverbs 15, verse 1, a, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Anybody had any anger stirred up recently? It happens, all right? It's not good to stir that stuff up. It explodes. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spout folly. It's foolish to just directly, flatly contradict somebody. It's disrespectful. But these people did this because they were godless. Not only were they godless, but they are full of the devil. They, they just wanted to murder Jesus. They actually had evil in their hearts. They had evil intent. They flatly contradicted him because they had evil intent. The devil's real. Evil's real. We have to combat it. We have to face it. We have to be honest about it. And there are certain things that are going on in our culture right now that, that are just evil. And you don't have to go out in the corner and put on a sandwich board that says, Repent, the end is near. It probably is, but you don't have to do that. But you can be prepared when people around you that start talking about things that matter that will listen to you if you're respectful and engage them respectfully. Don't flatly contradict them. Be a little bit Pauline. Be a little bit Socratic. Come in with a question. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? Don't you think, is it possible that what I always do is I just point to the Bible. I, you know, people say, well, this and that. And they'll make amazing assertions based on very little knowledge or experience. And I'll just say, well, let me share scripture with you. Can I tell you what the Bible says about that? And by the way, that's one of the most effective ways to share the gospel. Well, I believe this about God. I believe that about God. I believe the other. And people believe 10,000 things about God and 9,999 of them are wrong. The way that we help them to find God is say, can I share with you what the Bible says about that. If you're to die today, do you know you go to heaven? How do you think you get to heaven? Well, okay. They give a good answer. Praise God. Yeah, that's very scriptural. They give another answer. May I share with you what the Bible has to say about that? Because now it's not a personality contest. It's not me versus you. I got more knowledge than you. And that's a personality contest. But if I say, can I share with you what the Bible has to say about that? Now it's 35 plus authors of a book written over 1,400 years that miraculously is completely coherent and completely fits within itself to demonstrate that God loves us, we messed up, Jesus is God, and he fixes it if we say yes. And the fact that we say yes is not a work that earns it. It's just how we get there. It's an expression of faith, and then we're born from above. That's it. It's really simple. Man has made it very, very complicated. You don't have to walk on broken glass. You don't have to uh, do any number of things that every religion tells you to do to check the boxes. All you have to do is repent and believe. That's what you have to do. Change of mind that leads to a change of direction and set your heart on Jesus and make him your Lord. Surrender. It's a surrender. It's an I'm sorry. It's an I'm yours. And it's a new birth. And it's available. So these guys contradict Jesus. We'll wrap this up because it's time to wrap it up. Jesus comes back and says, no, actually, they say, well, you just one voice. You don't get to, you can't make a case with just one voice. Well, first of all, the law was written for men. What are men? Liars. Why are the women laughing? That's inclusive, okay? Men and women. Are, that's an inclusive term, y'all. Thank you, sweetheart. Men do lie. But man, they're getting more ladies like More heartily. Amen. All right. Yeah. The law is written because men are liars. And we have to confirm. We have to have extra witnesses because somebody says something doesn't mean it's true. Jesus is not a liar. Jesus is God. But not only is Jesus' testimony true because he's God and because he knows, it's also true because the Father came in and gave his voice to take away any doubt so that when there was a baptism of Jesus, People understood Jesus wouldn't get baptized because Jesus would be purified from sin. He had no sin. Jesus was being baptized as an example. Also as a pre-picture of what he was about to do for us. And so when the Father comes in, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. He makes it clear. There's nothing here that has to get washed away. There's nothing here that even symbolically is getting washed away. This is an example. And this is a picture of what he's about to do for you. And that is the testimony of God. And so even by... Even by moral human standards, the, the necessity is satisfied of two witnesses. In the, voice, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every fact be confirmed. But because he's God, that's not even necessary. 
But he does know. And so it's true. And so you see Jesus identify himself. These people attack him. And you see him respond uh, efficiently, effectively, like a master barrister. Again, he comes back like a lawyer. Hey, guys, no. Even according to your standards, the standards have been met, not only met, but exceeded. And so we have Jesus. We have him available. He is God. He made you. He loves you. He's there for you. All you have to do is say yes to him. Stand with me. Have you said yes to him? We have four yeses this week. It's an exciting week. Uh, I'm still all wet. i got to figure out those waiters. They're not working right. Something's not going well. I baptized myself. But <laughs> it's good to baptize others. Baptizing yourself, not so good. God is moving. And good things are happening. And uh, we're going to have a new believers Bible study starting Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, at the De Janeiro's big guest house. We're going to do that. Anybody else wants to join us, let us know. Good things are happening. Somebody asked me when are we going to start Sunday nights. Whenever y'all will come, let, let me know. Uh, 5.30 Sunday night, we'll, we'll start again. you got to let me know you're ready. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Is there anyone here today that needs to trust Jesus the same? As we get ready to transfer from our Facebook group, have you said yes to Jesus? Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. Belief, Pastillo, is just jumping out of that plane. You got the parachute on your back. You pull the cord. Until you pull the cord, you don't get the benefit. It's taking your lottery ticket to Austin. I know, don't, don't gamble. But until you turn it in and sign the back, you don't get the benefit. Ask Jesus right now to be the light of your life, to be your Savior, your Lord. Surrender to him. If you got any questions about how to do that, call me up. God, you're, Jesus, your God, I believe you died on the cross for me. Let that blood count for me. Be the boss of my life. We transition into the in-house. Is there anyone here that needs to make that decision?